So it's my pleasure and honor today to highlight what happened through three days at the 17th Annual Congress of Transplantation of Egyptian Society of Nephrogen and Transplantation uh, that was held at uh, uh, Helen Palestinian in Alexandria for three days. Uh, so it was very nice meeting, nice meeting regarding scientific contents, regarding a magnificent place and the gathering and time management and everything. So congratulations, Professor Hannah Hafiz and Professor Amir Rifai and Dr. Amr Hussain, the committee, Professor Hani, the SNT president, Dr. Amir Rifai, the uh, transplant chapter chair, and Dr. Amr Hussain, Amr Hussain is the uh, general uh, Congress uh, coordinator. I'm going to, uh, and this year, we have guests from US and from Europe and from Jordan. And through the coming presentation, I'm going to highlight the most important messages delivered through the presentations. So during this Congress, we have three plenary lectures, 38 presentations included in nine sessions for lectures, three communication session, transplant case scenarios session, one symposia and transplant quiz. So I'm going to focus on the messages. So the first day and first session included three talks. The first talk was exercise and sport after kidney transplantation. A changing lifestyle is the most important parameters, even neglected. So if you go to the guidelines, you will find lifestyle change is recommended for all societies and for all diseases. However, it is usually neglected. This is why Dr. Dean Abdel Latif delivered a very nice presentation about exercise. And one of the messages is increase the physical activity achieved through structured exercise programs, induced beneficial effects on metabolic profile and body composition in patients with chronic kidney disease and kidney transplant recipients. So it is a time to encourage all our patients, CKD, even dialysis, and in transplantation to do physical activity as tolerated. Because physical activity improves the majority of cardiovascular risk factors in our patients. And as you see, the Kidigo guidelines recommended undertaking an exercise program compatible, and this is the most important point, exercise compatible with cardiovascular health and tolerance. So I should individualize the prescription of exercise according to the tolerance of our individuals. This is, this is the wisdom of exercise. And she concluded from this presentation that the higher physical activity after kidney transplants seems associated with better, and this is very interesting, exercise is associated with better kidney allograft function. So we shouldn't be afraid of that. For kidney disease, for transplantation, exercise is beneficial for kidney functions. So long as it is individualized according to the tolerance of the patients. Impaired physical activity in real transplant patients may be associated with increased risk of cardiovascular and all cause mortality. During renal transplantation, physical activity seems to slightly increase spontaneously. Barriers to physical activity in renal transplantation are largely unknown, except of unnecessary fears from exercise. Exercise interventions in real transplanted patient has positive impact on aerobic capacity and muscle strength and well-being. Physical exercise in real transplanted patients seems to improve but not normalize the impaired cardiovascular fitness. So this is, I think it is very essential to encourage all our patients to be mobile, physically active, as they tolerate. The second presentation uh, delivered by Dr. Ahmed Hassan is very interesting also because sexual dysfunction 
is the most common symptom worldwide in all persons, not only for transplantation. So sexual and reproductive health care in our transplant recipients is of para amount importance. And this slide shows the common immune suppressive drugs used and their effect on male reproduction and some recommendation. So if we take tacrolimus, tacrolimus may reduce sperm count, may decrease fertility, but we advise for tacrolimus. So on clinical ground, we use tacrolimus for male and for females. Uh, cyclosporin decreases sperm count, testosterone level and fertility, increases LH and FSH in males, rat. However, we recommend to be used if the patient is maintained on it. Nowadays, we, we shifted all our patients, de novo cases, from cyclosporin to tacrolimus because we got the confidence with the use of tacrolimus based on the international literature and our own report here at the Urology and Nephrology Center. Cerulimus decreased testosterone, and we have few cases uh, cerulimus induced a spermatogenesis, a spermia. So we should be careful about that point. Mycophenolate uh, may have direct sperm effects, and there is hypothetical teratogenicity of the use of mycophenolate mofetel if the male receive mycophenolate mofetel and he wishes to be a father. But uh, with pregnancy, tacrolimus, cyclosporin, steroids, or other cyabrins can be used almostly safe. But mycophenolate, either mofetel or sodium, cerulimus, uh, everolimus, all these are not recommended during pregnancy. During breast uh, feeding, here we are from the school that recommend against breast feeding, but all over the world, there is increasing trend to allow females to lactate. And I think it is more physiological. However, uh, if the lady immunological status necessitates the use of mycophenolate or immotor inhibitors, we shouldn't allow lactation because there is no safety for these drugs on lactation. But steroids, minimal dose, calcineurin inhibitors on the therapeutic level, and other cerebrin can be used safely during lactation. Then, after marriage and the fertility, we expect to have infants. Okay, so what about growth of the babies after transplantation? This was a very nice presentation by Dr. Dua Salah. Growth and development after pediatric kidney transplantation. Growth, growth is very, very crucial for the well-being, not only for the patient, but as well for his or her family. But the problem is growth impairment after kidney transplantation is related to the environment before transplantation and environment after transplantation and the use of immune suppressive drugs, especially steroids, because steroids are associated with growth retardation. And more importantly, as cl clarified by do Dr. Dua, growth hormone therapy after transplantation is debatable. I know by heart it is contraindicated in the first year after transplantation. And here, if you read this slide, you'll find there is no agreement even to use growth hormone liberally. And in some countries, they used it in the field of research only. So the most important, the most important, to put many lines under this statement, to allow growth in pediatric transplant recipients is to offer best matching with the donor. Why? Because if we offer best matching, we can succeed in steroid avoidance or steroids to be used for one week until tacrolimus uh, the, uh, uh, is within therapeutic level. So the best intervention is 
trying to avoid steroid as we can. But we shouldn't stop steroid and there is immunological risk. So we should balance risk and the benefits. So the best matching can allow us to, to avoid steroids and this will benefit the growth of uh, children. Then Dr. Samir Sully uh, delivered an interesting presentation because this is one of the important presentation because it is uh, it offered the best quality of care. We should be, and I, I think Professor Mahmoud with us is also interested in this point, we should educate our patients. So education the patients to be within the shared decision making and to know the pro and the cons for everything. And one of the most important point that we need education is drug adherence. Because drug adherence is, what is, is single most common cause of late antibody mediated rejection and graft loss. So to improve intermediate and long-term outcome and to reduce chronic antibody mediated rejection is by optimizing the use of medications. How to optimize the use of medication is to educate patients that immune suppressive drugs are drugs to be continued forever. No play with drugs. The only doctors who are expert in transplant medicine who is only have the right just to change the medication. So if we educate our patient for this point, this may improve a lot, a number of cases. And I remember few cases here in, in our practice here, adolescent female stopped the immune suppression because she is transplanted for four years, creatinine is 0.8 milligram per deciliter, and she wishes to marry. At the end of the day, after four years of stable graft function, she become unstable in taking medicine, uh, immune suppressive drugs, slowly and creeping creatinine incre uh, occurs, graft biopsy, antibody mediated rejection, chronic rejection, graft loss, and her social life became unstable. We should be careful about that. And this is why we added in the outpatient clinic of the center, video education for the patient to continue medication, how to use medication, and I think this is important. Then, Dr. Hayam al Aggan delivered a very interesting presentation about vaccination. We shouldn't forget that immune suppressed patients are more prone to infections. So it is better to know what is permissible from vaccination and what is forbidden. And before transplantation, we should assure all vaccinations. Why? Because after transplantation, there are restrictions for the use of live attenuated vaccinations. So live attenuated vaccinations are contraindicated after transplantation. So we can give inactivated or toxins, toxoid after transplantation, but live attenuated vaccines are contraindicated. And if the patient received live attenuated vaccine before transplantation, we should postpone transplantation for at least one month. And it is better to avoid vaccination altogether within the first six months after transplantation, with the exception of influenza vaccines that can be used one month after transplantation. So this is a list of recommended vaccines after transplantation. Influenza vaccines, hemophilus influenza, pneumococcal vaccines, uh, uh, hepatitis B, ATC. So this is the list of vaccines that can be used and recommended after transplantation. And this is the list of contraindicated vaccines for renal transplant recipients. We shouldn't give varicella zoster, oral polio, because these are live attenuated vaccines. MMR, measles, measles mumps, rubella are contraindicated after transplantation. BCG for TB is contraindicated after transplantation. Because if we give live attenuated vaccines for transplanted patients treated with immune suppression, this may even lead to development of the diseases. So this is why we should finish vaccination before transplantation and to know that 
there are sa safe vaccinations that can be used after transplantation and the bad vaccination that is associated with hazards after transplantation. Another important lectures delivered by Professor uh, Tariq Midhat about nutritional assessment and nutritional care after kidney transplantation. We should learn how to manage the nutrition after transplantation. Dr. Tariq discriminated post transplant period into two periods. Immediate period, which is uh, designated as acute post transplant period and chronic period. For acute uh, pre -trans period transplant or post transplant period, we need more calories, more proteins. Why? To establish anabolic state for the patient. But after the immediate period of transplantation, we shouldn't forget that, that we need not to be liberal with calories. We don't like obesity and we don't like excessive protein. So in the immediate period of transplantation, we need to establish anabolism. But after that, to avoid unnecessary and poor advices for calories, protein, and other supplements. We, and the, the patient after transplantation, the advices are coping with the standards, healthy standards of nutritional advices for non-transplant patients. It is time for nutritional education programs to be incorporated as a part, as an important and crucial part of transplant care. After these three presentations, there was a hot discussion about the use of medications, and one of the most hot issue is the use of mycophenolate mofetels by male patients who are wishing to be fathers. Because European Medical Agency, since a couple of years, recommended against the use of mycophenolate mofetel for by, by male uh, patients. And if it is needed, he should uh, use condom. And if he wishes that his wife uh, to be pregnant, he should shift from mycophenolate to other cerebrin and continue on condom for 90 days. This is the European Medical Agency. However, this guidelines or recommendations are not convincing for many, many institutions. And the Norwegian study documented that there is no difference regarding teratogenicity between male fathers who are receiving mycophenolate or other cerebrin. And there was a, note, a notice or uh, editorial comment about the, this point in transplantation that when they measured mycophenolate in semen, it was very minimal. This is why I agree with the British recommendation, the Renal Association recommendations, that it is just theoretical teratogenicity to just be counseled with the patient, with the male who received, who, who wishes to be father. And another hot point in the discussion was potassium. Both in mind that potassium is the physiological antidote of sodium. So nowadays, we shifted our mind in nephrology to advise for potassium uh, diet, containing diet. But if the patient is receiving drugs that increases the risk of hyperkalemia, it's better to monitor uh, serum potassium in these patients. And some points in the nutritional prescription can reduce the risk of hyperkalemia, like diets including some, some carbohydrates. The presence of some carbohydrate within the fruits and the vegetables increases insulin. And the insulin will reduce hyperkalemia burden of diet. Number two, fruits and vegetables inc including larger amount of fibers. Fibers reduces potassium absorption. And it's better to look at uh, acid base because treating acidosis will reduce the risk of hyperkalemia from the diet. And then one of the most exciting presentation was delivered by uh, uh, Professor Hassan Ibrahim from the United States, who spoke about the safety of long-term outcome and the, long, and, and the better long-term outcome of kidney donors. Uh, he stated that the rule of 
99% of the donor will never develop any such kidney disease. 99% of donors not regret having donated. And he insisted that the, uh, we need to change some of our practices to maintain the absolute highest standard of safety of donation, but not at the expense of denying some people to whom restoring someone's livelihood is, is restoring their own. And donors with diabetes uh, should be considered. So this is his mind. Diabetic donor to donate, hypertensive to donate. But this uh, presentation highlighted and enlightened many debate from us. And I think he's very liberal for accepting donors because at the end of the day, when we accept a donor nephrectomy, it is not for the sake of the donor, except for psychological well-being to donate. But we should be careful. I think the right way in, is in the middle of the road. So he assured us that we may be more flexible than what we do because we are more rigid in discussion of the donor status. But we shouldn't accept the donor with multiple comorbidities to donate as we do. But it, the data presented by Professor Hassan Ibrahim, because he is one of the uh, experts in the field of kidney donors, and he published in the first class journals in New England, ATC. So this gives us assurance and some flexibility. But again, I think the right is in the middle of the road. A lot of discussion after this presentation from all attending doctors. Then the session of polar views. We have two polar points or two points for polar views. If the donor has cyst or cysts, do we agree to have the kidney from him? And this was the presentation of Professor Donia, and he was defending yes for donation. And it's not absolute like this, and I'm going to explain in a minute. And the second view was expected to be from Professor Fischer to say no, but at the end of the day, they agreed on the same concept. So it was not polar view. It is the same view. Accepting donation provided that, and this is what I'm going to explain. So to start with, we have Bosnia classification for renal cyst in general. This, we have, four categories, and you can say 2F is five categories. So category one, it is a single benign cyst with a hairline thin wall that doesn't contain septa or calcification. This is a, very, this is a typical uh, benign simple cyst that we don't give it uh, major attention. We agree about that point. Uh, Bosniak two, a benign cyst that might contain a few hairline thin septa, fine calcification. Uh, 2F, this cyst might contain more and more uh, thin uh, septa and the minimal enhancement of hairline uh, thin septum. Class 3 or category 3, these lesions are intermediate cystic masses that have thickened irregular walls. Four, these lesions are clearly malignant cystic lesions. So these are the five categories of Bosnia classification of renal cysts in urology, as we learned from our professors here in urology. So if we have a person who comes us to us to donate the kidney and he has cyst, do we agree to take this kidney? The answer based on the literature and the opinions, because this is one of the debatable or not covered well in the literature. And this is one of the uh, submitted data from the original Info Center by Professor Bidir and uh, et al. And this is the, we can hear uh, the, the authors compared 134 uh, persons with cyst. So this is donors with cyst, cyst group, and the control 1,000 cases. And this was very exciting as presented by Professor Donia during the conference. Cyst after kidney donation. What happens to the cyst? I, I take kidney, including a cyst, and transplant it. 
what occur to the cyst in the recipient side. Look here, the length and width of the cyst diminish. So both of them diminish and was very surprising. And I don't know why they regressed in the, in the recipient side. I don't know why. <coughs> but this is our data. And complementary kidney function is stable. So this is our assuring. If you transmit a kidney with cyst, if it is simple cyst, because we accept Bosniak 1 and we discuss Bosniak 2 in a firm discussion and, uh, and we cannot accept easily. But to the contrary to what happened in the recipient, cyst in the donor enlarges. Why? I don't know. Why there is a difference between the donor side and the recipient side, I don't have any explanation. And this, uh, I think, uh, when the paper uh, will be submitted, this part of the paper needs uh, discussions uh, intensively. So the conclusions from the two presentations, and this is from the slides of Dr. Donia, simple Bosniak one, renal cysts are not contraindication to, uh, for uh, donation because they are not associated with increased risk of complication or organ dysfunction or cancer. Transplanting a graft with Bosniak II cysts should proceed only after assessment for solid components, septations, and calcifications on CT or MRI to avoid accidental transplantation of a case with cystic renal cell carcinoma. So for, for Bosniak 1, no problem. For Bosniak 2, there may be a problem, but we, can, we may accept after thorough discussion and the shared decision between us as nephrologists, urologists, and the patient himself. From the, from the donor aspects, kidney with a small symbol, Bosniak cyst, can be left in the donor. Particularly if there are compelling reasons for donation, like father or mother giving the kids. So I can take, suppose that we have father or mother, 55 years old, uh, on one kidney there are two, two cysts, and on the left kidney there is one cyst. All these three cysts are Bosniak one, simple cyst. So we can take the kidney with two, two cysts and leave the other kidney with one cyst for the donor, to leave it to the donor. In most circumstances, Bosniak 2F or higher cysts shouldn't be left in the donor, but such decision should be individualized. I think I agree with this conclusion. Regarding the second point, thrombotic microangiopathy, it is a very challenging situation that we face here in the Center for Transplant Preparation. And through the two presentations by uh, Professor Montasser and Professor Foda, they discussed the issue. And I hear the, the title of their presentation, it challenges. So it is really a challenge. And the, I think uh, it is very easy to say, we need genetic testing to be present for all cases. We want the eclusumab to be available to accept uh, kidney transplantation, but we don't have eclusumab in Egypt. Even we don't have uh, well uh, developed genetic testing for all genetics related to the atypical hemolytic remix syndrome. But I think all of us agree that we shouldn't accept live related. Why? Because if the donor has the mutation and the donor will be exposed to surgery, donor nephrectomy, this may induce a typical hemolytic remix syndrome after kidney donation. So if we accept, we can accept on individual cases after discussions of the risk and the benefits and assessing other pathways of coagulation abnormalities, ATC, and if we accept, we accept for unrelated uh, transplantation, and I think Professor Foda highlighted a protocol how to deal with these cases. But the best way, the best security is to have genetic testing and to have eclusumab. Eclusumab is very, very expensive. Then the first day ended by three talks about the future of trans in trans future insights in transplantation. Both of these are the presentation. Uh, uh, Professor Hanna Hafs' future of immune suppression then I delivered RNA interference in organ transplantation 
and the session ended with nanotherapy and targeted immune suppression. So regarding the future of immune, sub and immune suppression as presented by Professor Haney, a lot of agents, innovations in desensitization, like ibnutuzumab. What is ibnutuzumab? It is anti-CD20, but it is different from rituximab. It is, rituximab is chimeric. Obnutuzumab is humanized monoclonal antibody. IDES, I think IDES is a magic drug, a magic bullet added to the, uh, the, to the transplantation armamentarium. Why? Because IDES is IgG in the days derived from streptococcus biogenes that clears all anti HLA antibodies. So if I clear anti HLA antibody by the drug that cleave antibodies and then I give optimum immune suppression and transplant. This carries a, a glimmer of hope to highly sensitized patients. And I think another class of drug is one stress inhibitors, anti interleukin 6, two silizumab, clazacuzumab, both of them are uh, humanized, monoclonal antibody against interleukin 6. And the ongoing studies are, will document the, if they will be valuable and the added tool for treating antibody mediated rejection in near future. Again, it is not only antibodies, but also uh, 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 T or t rex therapies or cell-based therapies. A lot of innovation there. And I think in the MD nephrology this year, in the written exam, there was a question about uh, the uh, t rex therapy in transplantation. So we, we should know the ideas, although it's not available and expensive in Egypt. Then I'm going to give some details about my presentation, RNA interference therapeutics. I start with the idea, and then if it is applicable in transplantation or not. So the, uh, what's meant by RNA interference therapeutic? Let us go back to the basic. Uh, so before um, I discuss the presentation, I acknowledged the, the efforts of uh, Dr. Amir Fai for he the chapter chair for this meeting. And then this is the basics of protein synthesis. We have in the nucleus DNA, okay, which includes genes. And the genes to have protein, genes should be translated into proteins. How to be translated, trans, uh, translated into proteins? First, DNA is transcripted into messenger RNA. And then messenger RNA after a process of maturation, because inside the nucleus, mRNA is, del is uh, delivered in phases, uh, primary, immature mRNA, then matured by process inside the nucleus. After that, mature mRNA exited the nucleus to the cytoplasm where ribosomes within the cytoplasm is the machinery of protein synthesis. So ribosome read the uh, uh, codes of mRNA to translate this into protein. So in RNA interfering therapeutics, so if, if the DNA is, is perfect, RNA is perfect, protein synthesis is good and healthy. If there is a problem in this point, what will happen? abnormal protein is delivered. Abnormal protein will lead to abnormal functions. So if we have diseases with abnormal uh, proteins, if we stop this abnormal protein synthesis, this will modulate the diseases. This is the simple principle. But the idea how to silence the gene, how to stop protein synthesis, this bad protein synthesis, this is the RNA interferon therapeutics. This is one of the model, double stranded RNA. RNA in itself is single strand. Why here it is double strand? Double strand has two strands. One strand will compete with mRNA, and the other strand is simply a carrier. Because if we inject a simple strand, it will be dissolved. So we need it in double strand. So we have long double strand RNA. When it is injected, it faces dicer, which is enzyme. This enzyme 
uh, it changes long double strand RNA into smaller ones. Smaller ones become cleaved by the uh, uh, RNA induced silencing complex into two uh, uh, strands. We have passenger strand, it will be cleaved, leaving the uh, sense strand or guiding strand that compete with mRNA. If it competes with this mRNA, bad protein will be stopped. Will, there will be no bad protein formed, no disease. And this is why, uh, before I'm saying this why, and this is how the, this RNA is injected. If you inject RNA within the blood, it will be cleaved immediately. This why should be carried by carriers like lipid carrier, lipid particle, and this lipid profile is developed by this company, Al Nilam, this United States, big company, uh, has a great innovation in the field of RNA interference therapeutics, or by in acyl galactosamine, uh, because it is efficient to reach liver, and the other carriers. A lot of carriers are there, because the smart way of the carrier, the smart process of RNA interference therapeutics. Just to show you, that it is a reality and not a magic. These are two drugs that were approved for treating amyloidosis, transthyretine amyloidosis. And both of them work on RNA interference therapeutics. One of them is typically double-stranded RNA, which is uh, uh, batizran, and the other one is single oligonucleotide and the sense oligonucleotide. So they are different in pharmacology. This drug is given sub-Q, and this drug is given intravenous. This drug, which is given intravenous, needs pre-medication. But this drug doesn't need pre-medication. The problem is, the first one is associated with thrombocytopenia, and it cannot be given in the presence of thrombocytopenia, and maybe associated with renal or hepatic dysfunction. So, but both of them are approved by uh, in the Europe and United States. And this is the Batiziran, which is under the name of Mbatro. So Mbatro is a drug for treating transthyretin amyloidosis. In transthyretin amyloidosis, there is neuropathy and maybe cardiac problems. And the drug is injected with lipid bilayer. It leaves lipid bilayer to work as silencing of mRNA so stop amyloid fibers of, fibers of formation. So this is the principle of the drug. Another drug is approved, or was approved in last November for treating porphyria, approved in the, uh, by FDA. And this is a drug named Givuziran, which is used to treat uh, intermittent porphyria. In transplantation, is there any work in, for using RNA interference therapeutics? This is the, the points. It is still experimental research, and there are uh, studies in human, phase one and phase two. If you look here, this is in 2018, first uh, report of RNA interference in kidney machine perfusion, then in the uh, heart, then in liver. So this year, uh, or the last year, on, uh, on March 2019, this was the first report of the use of small interference RNA uptake uh, for RNA interference during ex vivo, hypothermic and normothermic liver machine perfusion. What is the rationale of this? When we inject this against this, uh, this was the test against the FAS, so it stops the apoptosis and reduces damage of the graft. Because one of the, of the catastrophic end is occurrence of primary graft non-function or delayed graft function in liver, it is more uh, uh, damaging than the kidney. So this is uh, injection of the drug, and by confocal microscopy, it was there. Is there any research in the kidney? This one of the clinical human research is to be used, RNA interference therapeutics, to, for the sake of delay graft function. Uh, so this is a drug, CERNA, small interfering RNA against uh, inhibiting B53, also, for uh, the, this pathway to be inhibited, it's nice to have the kidney without delayed graft function. It passes first and second phase, 
and it is tested in the third phase trial. But uh, unfortunately, within this review article, the author of this review article stated in one of the paragraphs that based on personal communication, fifth three study using this drug uh, for treating 634 kidney transplant recipients, the results were not, was no, results were not successful. But we are waiting further development. I think the area of further development of use of RNA interferent therapeutics is within the field of hyperoxaluria and the primary hyperoxaluria. And this from Eurolithiasis Journal, we have three types of uh, primary hyperoxaluria. We have type one, type two, and type three. And we can use the drug, and the drug is Lomiziran. This is RNA interferon therapeutics against the rate-limiting enzyme for oxalate formation. And uh, fortunate uh, enough, in the kidney week last year in the United States, they reported the prime preliminary results of phase one, phase two study showing favorable effects by reducing oxalate. And it seemed the third phase is also encouraging. So if we have drug to interfere with the genes responsible about oxalosis, this will be, I think, although it is not in the transplantation, but I think it will help the, the patients with primary hyperoxaluria because it is a very difficult case scenario that we have. Uh, to have efficient RNA interference therapeutic, we should offer the best way to deliver them to escape the enzymatic degradation in the blood, phagocytosis, or even to allow better tissue perfusion. And the most important challenge is the cost. This drug is used for spinal muscle atrophy. Can you see the, the price of the drug? Can you see? 750,000 dollar in the first year. And this drug, which I, uh, I discussed on Batro and uh, the other, half million dollar per year. I think this is the most important uh, barrier. But I think everything in the beginning become expensive and then the price re is reduced. So we need more uh, innovation in this field by carriers and by uh, other methods. And I concluded at the end of this presentation that one day we would be able to achieve a knockout of all bad proteins for all genetically determined diseases like Borgeria, Alzheimer, oxalosis, ischemic refugee injury. And even in transplantation, we may have RNA therapeutics targeting tolerance. But to be honest, using RNA interfering therapeutics in organ transplantations are in their infancy. And the last, the first day ended with the presentation of Professor Gamal Saadi about here nanotherapy carriers and using carriers to deliver immune suppression to targets. Nanotherapy targeted drugs are tested in cancer. But Professor Gamal Saadi elegantly presented the presence of new waves of thinking for delivery from immune suppression. I think it was very uh, difficult uh, session, but this was the end of the first day. The second day started with free communication for research. And this is the list of research, uh, research presented in this day, Association of Insulin Growth Factor by Dr. Khaled Marzou, long-term follow-up of live donor renal, renal transplant, Dr. Anur, MMF monotherapy, uh, Dr. Shaima, relationship between rabbit ATG and post-transplant lymph orders, Dr. Ahmed, and then Dr. Mu'tasim uh, presented the 10 years follow-up of living kidney donor. I'm not going to discuss and deliver messages from this research. The only research that I'm going to highlight is this one, the impact of proton bomb inhibitors on mycophenolate pharmacokinetics in kidney transplant recipients, presented by Professor uh, Hiba Hamdi from Bani Swaif and the impact of proton bomb inhibitor on mycophenolate pharmacokinetics in kidney transplant recipient is very interesting. Why? Because proton bomb inhibitors reduce the pH of the stomach. So if the drug is absorbed in acidic media and you reduce the acidity so much, what will happen? We are afraid of reduction of absorption of mycophenolate mofetel in this environment. This is 
this is a philosophy of the study. So it is cross-sectional study, non-randomized, it's observational study, in the outpatient department at Hamad El Isa Organ Transplant Center in Kuwait. And uh, Professor Heba Hamdi collaborated with them. Patients were 21 years old and above, six months or more after transplant, had a stable course and all uh, signed a written consent. The study included uh, 50 patients in MMF arm and 50 patients in, in, in mycophenolate sodium arm. So these are the two uh, forms of mycophenolic acid related drugs. And the main results are using omeprazole was mycophenolic acid formulation didn't result in different exposure and the pre-dose concentration in late transplant patient. Although it is from the mind, it is, it is to be put in mind, and I think the industrial companies announce this point that we, we don't have problem with microfluorite sodium. We don't have problem with proton bump inhibitors, but the data here is challenging this dogma that we can use proton bump inhibitors with both of them. However, the area under curve is a little bit higher with microfluorite sodium. So the key message is it is better to try to avoid proton bump inhibitor as we can because of many side effects of this class of drugs and may interact with the immune suppressive drugs. If you are obliged, go ahead. Because the patient have gastritis, uh, severe reflux esophagitis, it's ATC. So we can use these drugs, putting in mind here the recommendation of authors to address mycophenolate levels and to study area under curve. Then Professor May Hasaballah presented, this is a, a, sh a shift in the paradigm of thinking how to deal with a uh, highly sensitized patient is to encourage bird donation. What's meant by bird donation? Turashru, what's meant by bird donation? Bird donation in a simple language. If you have two couples uh, here, we have uh, uh, donor one and recipient one. Donor one is not compatible with recipient one. And we have the second couple. Donor two is not compatible with recipient two. When we do testing, we will, uh, and we find that donor one is suitable to recipient two, and donor two is uh, compatible with recipient one, and we succeed to do crossover, what will happen? We will have two transplants. But if we insisted on this point, we may not transplant them. So allowing bird donation will, and th there, there, are, there are many logistics to be solved first, and there are many countries all over the world accepting, and even in uh, Saudi and other countries, there is a program for bird donation. And I think we are in bad need for this point, is to accept the idea, and even open chains. And it is considered in itself an innovation in kidney bird donation to Ahmed Bull in Hamad Al Isa. So, bird donation, and this was the conclusion of Professor May. Kidney bird donation is a remarkable innovation in and of itself. Kidney bird donation program has the following advantages an increase in the number of kidneys available for transplantation, allowing the most incompatible bears find a match and get transplanted, avoidance of the risks and the costs of the sensitization strategies, decrease waiting time on national transplant list, provision of living donor grafts, which are usually superior to cadaveric ones, both an end to commercial transplantation. So all these are advantages for kidney bear donation. And the kidney bear donation is the best option for living donations should be considered for all potential living donors. So maybe localize between two couples or maybe an open program for the community. But it need law, it need logistics to be accepted. And it's badly needed in Egypt. Why? Because of the absence of disease transplantation up till now, the non-familiarity with EBU incompatible kidney transplantation, and the high cost of desensitization and the existing commercial transplantation in some areas. So this is, these are the points. If we succeed 
to establish a bird kidney donation program in Egypt, I think this will be marvelous. Followed the presentation of Professor May, followed by Professor Oppenheimer about ABO in compatible kidney transplantation. And one of the key message is when we, ask, when we are in a, in a hospital or a center uh, working with ABA, major ABA on compatibility, the center adopt in desensitization. Desensitization is based on the level of IgG agglutinin titer. The higher the titer, the, uh, the higher the need for more and more desensitization and the higher the cost. And sometimes if it is very high, it may be uh, very difficult to do successful desensitization. I am myself concerned about ABO and compatible kidney transplantation because of expense and little bit poorer results in comparison to compatible transplantation. So I think again and again, the solution is to encourage bare donation. So what about the second stimulative presentation of Professor Hassan Ibrahim? He is liberal in accepting donation. So in this uh, in, uh, presentation, he discussed the issue of overweight and kidney donation. Dr. Ahmed, what do we do here in kidney donation? So if the donor is above 35, we don't agree, or at least encourage him or her to lose weight. And then coming to us after successful weight loss, we can agree about this point. So this is our policy. But he discussed these points. What are the concerns of obesity and the kidney donation? Obesity is associated with hyperfiltration. This, these are concerns, and he uh, doesn't mean they are fats. So obesity may be associated with hyperfiltration. Obesity associated with CKD and in the stage. Obesity is associated with diabetes and hypertension. Diabetes and hypertension may be worse in one kidney if uh, the person donate. Hyperfiltration from diabetes and obesity may make things worse. Surgical complications are high. Renal uh, uh, colon cancer is higher in overweight people, particularly in women and, else, and also smokers. These are concerns. But the facts, the link between obesity and the CKD comes from observational studies that have many limitations. Neither diabetes nor hypertension has a worse outcome in people with one kidney. A transplant recipient, renal cancer patient, trauma patients, and maybe also kidney donors. Fourth is overweight. So this excludes 25% of the potential donor pool. So this, these are the statements of Professor Hassan Ibrahim. And he mentioned that, yes, relative risk may be a little bit higher, but in absolute risk, it is very, very minimal. And he consider a, a safe practice to accept uh, some of these donors. Uh, so again and again, I think it's better to discuss, to uh, uh, weigh the risk and the benefit. And at the end of the day, the two presentations of Professor Hassan Ibrahim are considered a call for more uh, relaxed and, and more wise approach and less rigid approach in discussing donors. And to leave an ample of time with donors for shared decision making about the risks and the benefit. Then uh, Professor Oppenheimer presented transplantation of cystitis patient. Again, it is, uh, he, present, he uh, delivered a very nice presentation about desensitization and the new drugs added to desensitizations uh, helped a lot of centers to succeed in doing transplantation. But here again and again, application of paired kidney donation may be more wise for us here because of economic reasons. Uh, uh, a HECMA symposium presentation delivered uh, about pharmacokinetics of tacrolimus QD, advagraph in kidney transplantation. And after pre the presentation of Dr. Nasrullah, I discussed with him that as a transplant physician, I am not convinced by using advagraph from day zero because it needs a bit, little bit larger time to fulfill, fulfill stores and to offer a good level. What's your opinion? This was my question to him. He answered, it is better to start 
uh, by uh, minus two day. So we start at the graph two days before transplantation to allow to, to uh, fill this gap. And second point is to test the patient genotyping regarding cytochrome B3A5 to see if this patient is within expressor group or non-expressor group because expressor group will be fast metabolizer and non-expressor group will be slowly metabolizer. And fortunately enough, Dr. Mashali here uh, addresses this point in his PhD degree in transplantation in, in our center. And uh, we are working in collaboration with Greece Center. So we're waiting the results of these points. But again and again, I think uh, uh, using uh, sustained release drugs may be of value to avoid variability. This is a very nice point. And the, uh, if you remembered one of my presentations since one year, when I discussed if immediate release tacrolimus lead to tremors and headache, this is an indication for them, even real association guidelines to shift from immediate release to sustained release drugs. Nowadays, variability is a very uh, important issue. If it is solved by shifting from immediate release to sustained release, this may be a good uh, facility. But don't forget that the many uh, nephrologists in the Arab world are not uh, convinced by the using uh, sustained release within the short period of transplantation. So we can say in the first months of transplantation, use immediate release and then shift to sustained release after that if it is available. Then I uh, have uh, this presentation about pre-transplant immunology monitoring. And I started with this article. This is the 2019 expert consensus from Transplantation Society Working Group about anti and antibody mate rejection. I recommend all of you to read it in details because it included two parts, for diagnosis and for treatment. For the first line screening for allo antibody would be with single antigen bead as we do, uh, or live screening, but multi-antigen beads can also be used and this is level 1A. But, but the, the treatment is um, uh, of based on low evidence treatment and the best way for managing antibody mate rejection is to prevent it. How to prevent it? By offering best immunological monitoring and the best matching. Also, I recommend all of you to go through this uh, issue of January 2020 about the uh, data registry of renal transplantation uh, based on the 2018 data that released uh, this month and include a lot of data about kidney, liver, and pancreas and bone marrow transplantation. And one of the important issues, and I explained this before, we have in the immunological lab, we have two types of tests for HLA typing. We have low resolution and high resolution images or testing. High, what's meant by low resolution or high resolution? Low resolution detected the, the first, the big molecules. But the high resolution detects even the change in three amino acids consequences. So uh, high resolution may detect a change in the molecule in three amino acids consecutive known as triplet or non-consecutive eblet. So the, these are very sensitive to minor change. So I can, if this is A2 and this A2 by low resolution, yes, they are typically fit, matched. But if I apply high resolution technique, it will say it is A2 and A2, but it's A2 type, certain type, different like than this. And before this, I, as an example, just to understand what's meant by low resolution or high resolution, if I see a person coming from far, I can say this is a man coming. But when he becomes an error, I can say this is Ahmed, this is Muhammad. Because with nearer exposure, I can, I can describe it accurately. This is why high resolution images are fantastic, but are not available everywhere. So now we are switching from saying HLA and DR mismatch into ablet or triplet mismatch. The higher the ablet or triplet mismatch, the higher the load of mismatch, 
the higher the risk of antibody mediated rejection later on, and the lower the graft survival. So the, all, the, all these data are stimulative, and this is a large cohort of patient, patients included 118,000 patients, documenting that ablet mismatch is important in transplantation. Regarding DSA, all of us are aware with DSA. So DSA, if it persists, this is the second point, if it persists, it become more bad. And the presence of DSA, if it's above 3,000 lymph nodes intensity, is more damaging in live donor kidney transplantation even than cadaveric transplantation as shown from the hazard risk here in comparison to uh, the, this is the living and this deceased. If it's up below 3,000, the hazard risk is 2.1 in living, but here 1.5. About, above 3,000, here approximately three falls, here 1.9. This means that presence of this CA is bad news, importantly, in live donor kidney transplantation. Generally speaking, to test for antibodies, we have two types of testing. We have functional assays and we have binding assays. To simplify, functional assays means CDC, or if we detect the DSA, we can detect complement binding property inside the lab. So without doing CDC cross match. So we have C1Q Luminex. We have C3D Luminex. 3-1Q, C3D are known as uh, 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 functional assay. If we don't include the complement in the equation, it is a binding assays. These are the two ways. Again, persistent DSA is uh, bad. Fixing in 3D complement is also associated with higher antibody mediated rejection and impaired graft survival. I think one of the important issues, there are accumulative cumulative data about the value of testing for HLADQ to match for HLADQ. Why? Because in this study, HLADQ antibodies phosphorylate act and S6 kinases in microvascular endothelial cells. And this activation uh, prior to culture with anoreactive lymphocytes increase interleukin sets. So a lot of problems are there. Another marker, although it is not in the lab, is in the tissue, in which testing for endothelial mesenchymal transition, E and MT. So if we test in the lab, in the blood for DSA, and in the tissue, in the kidney biopsy, for the markers of endothelial mesenchymal transition by the special tests. This is a study included 351 graft biopsies from 248 kidney transplant recipient. Here, if there is the, uh, the endothelial mesenchymal transition is positive, survival probability is reduced, the graft survival is affected. And if there is combination of antibody mediated rejection plus endothelial mesenchymal trans transition, the survival is more and more drastically affected. And the best way is to have no antibody mediated rejection and no endothelial mesenchymal transition. This means that there are many innovations. The, there is a caveat for Luminex. Luminex, yes, it is very sensitive and very specific for anti chile antibodies, but we should know the limitations. Limitations may be in the personnel working. Even changing the bipet, it changed the results. It changed the protocol, it changed the results. If antibody activates complement, the fragments of complements on the beads can prevent reactions and it can prevent detection of other anti chile antibodies present in the serum. So we should know all these limitations. The antibody may be against hidden engines. So if, if complement fragments prevent the detection of antibodies, this is known as brozone effect. So a lot of data are there, uh, and we need to refine our lab. To add to the complexity, we study TB lymphocytes in it immunity, and today the kidney talk back, there is interaction between kidney proximal convoluted tubule cells and the immunity. And the proximal convoluted tubule cells can increase and enhance immunity. So this is why we should know the environment of the kidney. Uh, because proximal community will may share in HLA 
manifestations and antigen recognition. Why you do immunological monitoring? Why you do all these to stratify the risk of the patients? Very simple idea. If we have best matching, no anti chile antibody this is of low risk. If we have poor matching with no antibodies, this intermediate risk, if we have poor matching and presence of this, it is very high risk. So this is in a simple language, but there are many details because of the time I'm going to moving forward. What about post transplant immunology monitoring? There are many methods in the literature and in innovations now testing us, telling us about immunometry. However, Professor Adam, through his presentation, is challenging this dogma because it's not easy to apply all the literature. So this is why he asked the uh, expert uh, attending about their use of these biomarkers. And uh, I think the answer was still, still we need further evidence for using markers. Then the issue of non HL antibodies uh, was addressed by Professor Fayad and the key message. We need not, not to do routine non HL antibody testing before transplantation. Why? As Dr. Mohammed Hamid is with us, and there is a very nice video for him about this point, because there are many, many non HL antibodies. And they may even present normally in the person. But the problem if they appear in higher titer, maybe with some exception in patients with hypertension, severe hypertension, or with FSGS, we may like to know if angiotensin type 1 receptor antibody present or not. Maybe. But up to this point, there is no convincing data to monitor non HLA antibodies before transplantation. And the most agreed upon. This is, and this is the expert opinion in the field of transplantation, is to reserve testing for patients. Biopsy and HLA testing are not explaining the issue. So if you have rejection and HLA antibody is negative, it may be the tuna HLA antibody, maybe. So if I test and I find the positivity for non HLA antibody, I continue treating humoral rejection because biopsy is the same and the treatment is the same, with the exception of angiotensin type 2 uh, one receptor antibody, if it is positive, we add angiotensin receptor blocker to the treatment armamentarium. But we give IVIG plasma ATC. Antibody mediated rejection is still a big headache, as shown uh, here by Professor Dickman. Antibody mediated rejection is major cause of graft loss. Active antibody mediated rejection should be treated with uh, antibody removal techniques and the IVIG plus or minus rituximab. This is a standard of care. However, based on, it is based on low level of evidence. And there is no evidence that bortezomib uh, has a role in routine therapy. For chronic antibody mediated rejection, no standardized treatment accepted. Conventional treatments have failed and are associated with significant comorbidities. Maybe the hope in anti interleukin 6 therapy, and you are waiting the results of ongoing studies. Again and again, what is uh, written in this uh, expert consensus meeting is treatment of antibody mediated rejection is still based on low level of evidence. Professor Ta El Baz elaborated the bone health and the kidney. Is, that, is renal transplantation the end story of bone disease and CKD MBD? Uh, unfortunately, not. After transplantation, we have a vascular necrosis, we may have osteoporosis, ATC. And even, uh, so the noise may be coming louder after transplantation. Sinacalcid is used to treat hyperparathyroidism, but be careful because Sinacalcid increases excretion of calcium and hypercalcuria have lead to allograft nephrocalcinosis. Sinacalcid may reduce tacrolimus so if we prescribe, Dr. Summer, if we prescribe tacrolimus with cynical set with tacrolimus, we should pay attention more and more to tacrolimus level because there is interaction. So this will add again to the statement uh, that we discussed with Kentucky team and Professor Amr Hussaini about 
the our fear of using silical seed after transplantation to be limited to short period of time. Anti-diabetic drugs. Uh, this was the presentation of Professor Magdi Sharawi, and he stated that consideration considerations of selecting anti-diabetic medication in post transplant patients should depend upon efficiency, efficacy, safety, drug-drug interaction. If you remember, since three years, we established here from clinical pharmacy department uh, 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 our algorithm about drug-drug interaction with anti-diabetic drugs. And this is one of the algorithms, as you see. So if the patient is receiving cyclosporin, don't give ribaglanide with cyclosporin. Why? Because cyclosporin inhibits ribaglanide metabolism that may lead to hypoglycemia, ATC. The third day, it was a short day, but it was very, was very fruitful. We started with the case presentation uh, of Dr. Dina Abdel Latif, very nice case. Kidney transplant recipient presented with recurrent pancreatitis and CMV and with high tacrolimus level. So the, uh, the message is it because of CMV uh, or it is because of tacrolimus toxicity. And she presented these two case reports within her case. Uh, acute pancreatitis associated with tacrolimus in kidney transplantation, acute pancreatitis associated with CMV. So which is which? And the main discussion, the main point the, she concerned is tacrolimus. And at the end of the day, they succeeded to treat the patient efficiently because after treatment with CMV, he developed the leukopenia that resolved by using inubigen. And it was not associated with CMV at that time. But we added in the discussion because the case opened the whole discussion. So uh, uh, Professor Rifai, uh, Professor Adam and me discussed these points and we discussed the issue. It may not be mycophenolate, uh, tacrolimus, it may be mycophenolate because there is a case report in the literature in lupus nephritis treatment with MMF associated with convulsion. And when they measured the mycophenolic acid, they find very high level. So which is which? It is tacrolimus or mycophenolate or CMV. And the message is, so long as you are putting your eye on the patient, focusing on everything, I think this is the best way is to deliver a better care. The second case by Dr. Mustafa, it was very interesting because the patient is, was very polyuric, 70 liters, seven zero liters up to this. How to do fluid balance for this patient? Why he is polyuric after transplantation? This may be, may be due to central diabetes insipidus that was masked in the period of dialysis by receiving transplantation. And there are some case reports in literature about unmasking of central diabetes insipidus by renal transplantation. But the case was uh, not straight like this. Then Dr. Mohammed Hosni presented the case of FSGS recurrence and complicated by rejection and non-HL antibodies. And we discussed many points in this case. And the most important point is that when we do graft biopsy, be attention, please. That when we do graft biopsy to patient uh, with original kidney disease, glomerulopathy, we should reserve a core for AM. Because recurrence of FSGS may be diagnosed only by, by fusion of food process in AM not necessarily FGS in a light microscope. If you wait until you find segmental sclerosis, it's late in diagnosis. So the, how to diagnose recurrence? Testing for, for proteinuria and doing AM uh, biopsy. Biopsy with AM core, okay? <clears throat> uh, and in this case, open the issue of angiotensin uh, type two antibody with FGS, but in this case, it was negative. Then pregnancy with transplantation, we discussed many points in this case. And the, uh, then challenges of retransplantation was elegantly presented by uh, Dr. Adel Bakr. Uh, he presented 12 challenges. But I'm not going to summarize 12 challenges to you. Only two points. Preemptive transplantation. Do you agree, Ahmed, for preemptive transplantation for uh, retransplant patient? Yes, provided that. It is not yes for all. If the graft, the first graft survived more than one year, and there is no nephrotic, suppose that it is it continued for more than one year, but the patient had bad recurrence FGS with severe proteinuria, I can wait a little bit. 
but if if it, if the first graft survival is more than one year, we can do preemptive transplantations long as we have donors, because dialysis is uh, in comparison to transplantation is more worse, and the kidney transplantation is superior in everything to dialysis if we can go ahead successfully. The second point that I'm going to uh, highlight is the issue of graft nephrectomy, because we have Professor Mahmoud with us. Uh, the uh, graft nephrectomy is it routine, Ma Ahmed? It is not routine. So the message is there are pro and cons for graft nephrectomy after the failure of the first graft. And the decision of graft nephrectomy is based upon discussion with surgeon and the symptoms. If the patient has intolerance syndrome like graft tenderness, severe inflammation and anemia, this may necessitate graft nephrectomy. And if the graft failure occurs in a very short period of time, so this may an, may, may an indication for graft nephrectomy. Don't forget that graft nephrectomy is bad surgery, is difficult surgery, a lot of complications. So our thinking is to reserve graft nephrectomy to indications, clinical indications, and according to the surgeon, the surgeon preferences. Because if, he, if, if it is for third time or fourth transplant, he may find it wise to remove, it is wise to remove the preference graft. Then Dr. Mohammed Salah presented uh, liver and kidney, and uh, he bought algorithm for uh, single liver transplant or combined liver and kidney. And uh, uh, Dr. Ahmed Kuria discussed a very interesting issue for us, critical illness after kidney transplantation. And every day, we discuss some cases about the ICU admission, the cause of admission, maybe infections, shock, comas, etc. Acute renal failure, uh, acute kidney injury after transplantation. So a lot of critical illnesses may be witnessed after transplantation. And the wisdom, how to deal? Should we stop immune suppression for all cases? I think the wise approach and the critical evolution of the patient mandate the situation. So if there is infection and the patient in low immunological risk, we should stop antiproliferative drugs to start with. Because antiproliferative drugs, antiproliferative drugs uh, are uh, 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 against the uh, uh, to stop infection, you need lymphocytes and immunity. The use of antiproliferative drugs prevent immunity against infection, and the humber uh, uh, hinder the immune response against infection. If the patient is high immunological risk and his state may cope with continuing immune suppression, or continuing immune suppression. If his life is critical by immune suppression, we should stop immune suppression, irrespective to what happened to the graft uh, function. At the end of the day, admission to ICU after transplantation should be taken care because it may be associated with uh, graft failure, dialysis, or mortality. The last presentation, this was the last presentation of the third day by uh, Professor Dickman about a conversion of immune suppression or immune suppression conversion strategies. He summarized, this is a summary of his presentation. So far, CNI remain to be the baseline immune suppression. So the data are not convincing to generalize immune suppression conversion in kidney transplantation. And I asked him during the presentation, are you, uh, do you believe, dear sir, do you believe in Blatacept in the era of Tacrolimus? Because Blatacept win the game against cyclospore. But there is no sufficient data about the superiority of blatacept to tacrolimus. So blatacept is given by infusion, very expensive, not available in everywhere, and no superiority on tacrolimus for my mind. So he answered that, I agree with you, but it is another armamentarium added to the immune suppression protocols, and there are many innovations in the field of co-stimulation blockade, so we need a lot, a lot. The message is, we shouldn't play so much with immune suppression unless there is compelling indication to shift from one drug to another. So uh, the, as I mentioned in the beginning, all the activities, the, the primary aim of conference and meeting is to improve our care, to improve our standing for treating patients because the patients, we, all of us are working uh, to, uh, for the sake of the patients. So this is why we add everything to this site. This is a very nice academy, very wealth site. And if you go, you'll find the majority of presentation are already uploaded 
uh, in this site, you can download and, and see the contents. And even more, if you go to the Facebook, uh, to see the photos and everything, go to my uh, page and here click alb uh, albums to find the album of 17 SNT Renal Transplant Congress. And you'll find 605 photos uh, to uh, see a lot. At the end of my presentation, I would like to appreciate and congratulate all the SNT uh, uh, committee and the board, especially. Uh, Professor Hani Hafiz, the president of SNT, Professor Amir Fahd, the chapter chair of transplantation and secretary general of uh, SNT, for the success of renal transplantation congress. Because renal transplantation is one, if it is not the most important pillar in nephrology practice. And uh, selecting the best place, I think Hena um, Blastin and uh, Alexandria is one of the magnificent places and we enjoyed the place, so the place, scientific contents, the audience gathering are uh, very crucial for the success of this meeting. Hoping all of you the best, inshallah, and uh, I'm ready if you have any questions. Do you have any questions? Okay.